47 seconds of logos. Backwards N, school spell with a K. How old is Andy supposed to be in this movie again? Because unless it's six, he should know better. Either that or he made all these box buildings as a six-year-old and is still playing with them years later, which is just sad. I brought my attack dog with a built-in force field. Well, I brought my dinosaur who eats force field dogs. Children's imaginations. Computer animation baby collects another soul if you look it directly in the eyes. Also, in this giant-ass two-story house with only one adult, why the hell does Andy have to share a bedroom with the baby sister? Does mom have, like, three separate crafting rooms? Andy is a dick to Woody. This household has a Super Nintendo system, but apparently no games to play with it. Also, Andy has a Super Nintendo, but would still rather play with Woody dolls. Probably because of the lack of games, I'm guessing. See you later, Woody! Unlike most kids, Andy actually closes the door to his room. And good thing, too. Or else the toys would have to wait until no one was in the house to come to life. Pull my string, the birthday party's today? With the sheer number of toys strewn around this house and Woody's apparent wealth of logic and street smarts, there is no way he would get the date of the birthday party wrong. Overly dexterous plastic pig not only tosses coin in the air without opposable thumbs, but also lands it perfectly straight up so it goes into his piggy bank slot. I'm Picasso! I don't get it. You uncultured swine! How did Mr. Potato Head even know Picasso's work to make the joke in the first place? Either Slink has all these checker pieces set up on the wrong color, or else, and I really hesitate to say this, but I may have been playing checkers wrong my whole life. Do the pieces not go on the black squares? Sorry, John Lasseter, no one is reading a supposed 200-page book concerning your 1988 Oscar-winning short Tin Toy. Nice try, animators. What do you say I get someone else to watch the sheep tonight? The scene does not contain a cartoon lap dance. Also, the idea of toys having sex? They're still plastic, right? It opens up so many questions about lubricants and chafing and whether these toys were built anatomically correct. I forgot I was watching a kid's movie. Everybody hear me? Yeah, they can hear you. And possibly Andy and his mom can hear you too. And everybody outside that open window as well. A minute ago, Woody needed the speaker to move away so there wouldn't be feedback. Now he can stand as close as he wants. Take a look at all those presents. I can't see a thing. What if Andy were to walk in the bedroom right now, huh? Do you people have any idea the emotional scarring you'd cause if he saw all this? Woody doesn't order the soldiers out to do recon for another 45 seconds or so, so they literally have no way to know if Andy's approaching, but they're still way out of position. None of the neighbors see this stuff. Am I the only person in America who spies on his neighbors? Wait, his totally solid plastic binoculars actually work? It's a board game! Repeat! Battleship! Geez, if not for the surprise Buzz Lightyear later, Andy's gifts would be proof that he's unloved. These toys open the closet door without using the handle. Buzz Lightyear to Star Command. Come in, Star Command. Do all toys start out thinking they're real, or is Buzz unique in that regard? Did all the other toys have a similar coming-to-grips-with-it experience? I found my moving buddy. What a whore. Buzz is in the typical I'm a toy pose here, but how did a deluded toy such as himself ever learn to do this? How did he know not to say anything to humans when he really thought for a fact that he was a space ranger? Sud some strange things I you know what? Bravo for simulating the passage of time with the shadows. That just blows my mind. This is a hilarious moment when Buzz thinks he's gonna die, but you're telling me this is the first time since his arrival that his helmet has come off? Andy has had enough time to change his posters and linens and ditch Woody for a new favorite toy, but he hasn't pressed all the buttons yet? A real little boy pushed all those buttons back as soon as the gift was open. Every single piece of exploded combat Carl debris flies straight at our main characters, instead of any of the other directions in the 360 degree spectrum that it could have flown. Somehow this nudge from the car knocks all these tacks out of the corkboard. Ah, I see Buzz Lightyear went to the Prometheus school running away from things. <laughs> Buzz Wilhelm. Hey mom, be right down! This is why this toys come to life while humans are gone thing would never work. They got bailed out here only because Andy yelled down to his mom. Wide open window is still left wide open when family leaves for Pizza Planet. I'm assuming they're going to Pizza Planet at a decent hour, but they go to a filling station that is practically deserted and a surrounding town that looks totally deserted. Can I help pump the gas? Sure, I'll even let you drive. Also, Andy always closes his door at home, but he leaves the van's door wide open while they pump the gas and presumably go into the store, allowing not only Buzz and Woody to exit, but for any hobo to sneak into the van. Also, it took like five seconds for Andy's mom to put the nozzle in the gas tank, start fueling, and completely leave the gas pumps so that Woody and Buzz could have their fight and no one could see it. Okay, not to be an asshole or anything, but once you're out of the view of the driver, you don't need to sit still, do you? You are a toy! Woody and Buzz argue loudly so that any truck driver could hear. Luckily, no one does. Conveniently, the Chuck E. Cheese-like Pizza Planet also delivers and just happens to drive to this abandoned gas station where I heard a guy got murdered that one time. Monstrous stack of pizzas allows Buzz the perfect cover. Also, isn't this plan totally over once he grabs the pizzas and delivers them to whomever? 
He's gonna see him when he takes the pizzas or when he comes back, right? Pizza delivery guy leaves his pizza sleeves in the truck to keep Buzz's plan working. Pizza Planet serves a 128 ounce mega gulp. Also burgers. Buzz and Woody demonstrate they can somehow see out of these containers by freezing in position well before the kids run by. Then demonstrate they can't see out of the containers by running into each other. Sid just happens to be at the Pizza Planet because evil always lurks at pizza themed restaurants. I go on to a better place. Sid puts one quarter in and gets a prize on the first pull. This claw works unlike any other in the history of the prize machine universe. I'm sorry, Sid doesn't win this one. There's no way. Evil character has at least one light source that is a single bulb swinging free from a chain cliche. Here's where Buzz finally learns that he's just a toy, but one thing is off about this. It's this room. The adult sleeping in the recliner is obviously into hunting, with the duck wallpaper and the deer head mounted on the wall. There are cans strewn about that say cola and root beer, but we should take these to suggest alcohol, not soft drinks. There's a wrench used to turn on the power of the TV and a coat hanger used as an antenna. A forlorn guitar propped up against it. It's a poor family, possibly a failed musician. What program is this down in the dumps adult watching where a Buzz Lightyear commercial targeted at kids would be playing? The string of Christmas lights that Woody was hiding in have disappeared in this shot and magically reappear in this shot. How would you even begin to get back into position and put this away in time if someone walked into the room right now? Woody's been gone for, like, not even a day yet and everything falls apart. Catch this! <laughs> that would be an impossible throw for a human to make. Even Dude Perfect would need like 20 or 30 takes. But they're cannibals! We saw them eat those other toys! That's great, but how does Sid explain this to himself when he sees the magically fixed toys? It sure wasn't his parents that did it. Can you fall asleep and stay asleep while still holding something like this hat? Wouldn't it drop to the floor the moment you started to drip off? Okay, movie, you cheated. Just 15 seconds ago, Buzz couldn't even look at his foot without making the standard noises that accompany the movement of hard plastic toy action figures. But then so we can have a little woody surprise, Buzz is suddenly able to stand up and walk away and climb up on top of the crate without making a single sound, with a heavy-ass rocket taped to his back. Sid's alarm clock goes off at 7 a.m., which he set the previous night at 8.25. That means it took roughly 11 hours for Woody to start asking Buzz to help while he was under the crate. What the hell was he doing before then? Toys don't need to sleep. Okay, let's move! Either Sid is taking way too long to launch his firecracker buzz, or these misfit toys and Woody put together a fairly elaborate plan way too f***ing quickly. Sid's sister heard the doorbell, but not the skateboard full of toys going down the stairs. Two, one! Reach for the sky! Woody waits much longer than he needs to in order to distract Sid. I mean, sh that fuse is practically lit already. Wind-up frog comes out of the mud completely clean. I'm okay with talking sentient toys in a movie. I really am but I'm not okay with talking sentient toys that can run fast enough to catch up to a truck moving at even the slowest speed. Toys' plastic fingers have a stronger grip than a dog's jaws. In other words, yeah, no, Woody is puppy chow. Andy's family moved without sealing their boxes. Well, thank goodness for that conveniently timed and extremely long red light. This is cute and all, but you can clearly see that while Woody is being spun, he only has the accelerator pressed on the controller, and nothing is touching the steering wheel abortion, so RC should not be spinning in circles right now. Also, RC is a talking sentient toy like the rest of them. There are times in this movie where he freely moves of his own will, so how does this work? Does the remote control supersede RC's own will as a thinking toy? Why doesn't the remote controller have its own separate sentient personality? <laughs> There's a jump button on that controller, too. This guy in the blue car must be flipping out. Seeing a remote control car driving two other toys toward a moving van with a bunch of other toys cheering them in the back? Whoever's driving this truck doesn't notice this shit. <laughs> ah, Disney. Didn't we get enough of that song the year before this came out? I'm sorry, Slink, but in my experience with your sort of toy, you're basically worthless forever now. You'd make a decent instrument for strangulation or accidental maiming of oneself, and that's about it. The rocket! The match! Wow, that match never fell out during all that? Hell, I'm kind of surprised the rocket didn't fall off, but the match? That thing is long gone. And don't get me started on Woody's hat, either. <laughs> what? This is where I stop and ask you to ponder one thing. If Sid had never tortured Woody, then Woody and Buzz would never be able to put this plan together and be returned to Andy, which means the movie's sort of saying torture is a necessary evil. And I'm okay with that. And I am not okay with that. The street was dead empty for, like, forever just a second ago. Hey, wow! Andy asks no questions why the two toys he was looking for suddenly show up in a box right next to him. 45 seconds of logos, again. Awesome! Did Disney buy DC as well? Is it Superman? Even though this movie is great, like a solid A, that doesn't change the fact that it's the third best Toy Story film. Super short fluff sequel finds time for over three goddamn minutes of imaginary Buzz Lightyear video game adventure bullshit. Seriously? Buzz breathes like a discount Darth Vader? And he's white too? 
I know Gary Reinstrom is a big part of the sound of this movie, but damn, dude, how many times are you going to go to that Star Wars well? Hey, this will be the first year I miss Cowboy Camp, all because of my stupid hat! Woody has lost his hat. Has anyone checked with that f***ing prankster shark? The boy who wrote that would take you to camp with or without your hat. Does he have any reason to think he can't go to camp without the hat? Because if not, Woody needs a psychiatrist more than he needs Andy. Hey, yeah. Where'd you find it? Well, that's the bad news. <laughs> So wait, did Slink steal the hat back from the dog and then manage to outrun said dog? Because you know Slink is a slinky with very poor motor skills, right? <gasps> okay, have a good weekend. I see the humans in this house continue to give the toys extremely helpful warnings before anyone walks into a room and has their world change forever. Five minutes. Hmm. It would take 15 minutes bare minimum to set up all these army men. That's probably the joke they're making, but f it. Five minutes is five minutes. <laughs> Somehow this hasn't happened before now. Also, a small tear will somehow mean Andy can't take this toy he's been taking to cowboy camp for years to cowboy camp. Candyland, Mousetrap, Twister, Guess Who, Life? Where's the f***ing chutes and ladders, assholes? Andy's mom has had some work done, no? She looks nothing like she did in the last movie is what I'm saying. You know, I feel like Andy continued his love of Woody simply because the first movie demanded a happy ending. This kid would have moved on from Woody two weeks after they moved into the new house, with that. Woody drops his dead arm, but then also has a perfect view of Andy getting into the guy. Ah, Super Nintendo! Let's play some Bomberman right f***ing now! You know, if you're gonna make a joke about cousin AJ, Joe, Jim Bob writing a book about the real, real big trucks, you might want to make that thing 300 pages lighter. You know what I mean, Vern? Nearly every board game in this stack is also a movie with the same name. That Guess Who movie really went off the rails when it came to adapting the source material. I sinned a whole bunch of stuff, and the whole thing turned out to be a dream sequence. But the movie is a dickhead for spending its first 12 minutes on video game footage and dream sequences. Also, even toys have disturbing dream sequences. <laughs> now, what if this happened while Andy was in the room? Nah, she just told him that to calm him down, and then put me on the shelf. Yeah, but you guys are living toys, right? Why have you never made your presence known since you were put on the shelf? Does the shelf have some sort of magical properties we aren't aware of? No one could hear me. Yeah, your squeaker is broken, but not your voice. Yard sale! All the toys freak out about a yard sale sign the mom is hammering into the front lawn, but I'm much more concerned about a mother who opens a yard sale on her property without even so much as a hint about which toys her son is willing to part with. And while I'm at it, how convenient is it that Andy's not home right now? Okay, boy, to the yard sale! Yeah! What? That dog understands English? Or you already taught at the command for to the yard sale? I mean, I can suspend my disbelief with the best of them, but you're stretching it here, man. These toys move in the presence of humans so damn often it's a wonder they ever even try to pretend they're non-animated toys. Back to Andy's room. After all that trouble hiding, Woody will now ride the back of a dog in full view of anyone who cares to look up. Super well-trained toy-friendly dog is utterly clueless when his best toy friend falls off in the front yard, because the script called for conflict. Perhaps the least believable thing about any of the Toy Story movies is that Al from Al's Toy Barn would be lurking at this exact yard sale at this exact temporary moment when Woody finds himself trapped, and that Woody falling on a table would accidentally trigger his voice prompt, which is the only reason Al even found out he was here. I mean, goddamn. Oh, he's stealing Woody. Al, who is a known local celebrity featured in tons of commercials, thinks he can can steal Woody no problem right after being a pushy bastard about buying it. And don't give me that he dresses like a chicken stuff either because his face is clearly visible. Buzz's hand somehow punches this trunk open, which I'd normally sin, but I'm gonna take the sin back for all the detail the animators put in to show scratches all around its keyhole. A nice touch indeed. He didn't have a beard like that. Did you guys see this dude or not? How does a ZZ Top beard ever become part of the equation? The kidnapper was bigger than that. Oh, picky, picky, picky. Just... Slink would be amazing at cinema sins, but Ham would be amazing at being our critics. I can't believe I have to drive all the way to work on a Saturday. All the way to work! This asshole dresses in his chicken costume before driving to the commercial shoot. If Al comes bursting back into the room right now, these living toys are all busted as hell. There's no way they can all get back into place in time. Not to mention how many styrofoam peanuts they've strewn around the room at this point. But toys play dead when humans are around thing really loses its luster when you just script the humans out of the way whenever you need it. Say hello to the prospector! Do you get the sense that Joan Cusack signed up for this because she thought it was the sequel to Toys? Oh wait, nobody would do that. Stupid question. Why the prodigal son has returned. You know he's evil because the voice is Sideshow Bob. Wow. <laughs> what the hell? Why does Collector Owl Dude have priceless Woody magazines strewn across the floor? Answer, he doesn't. He just made a cool shot, so they did it. Every single one of these tapes is episodes four through six. I reckon we ought to get out of here. They've been sitting here dumbfounded watching TV for hours. And even if Al somehow ended up doing a hundred takes on his chicken soup commercial across the street, there's no way these f***ers knew that was happening. So they should be caught dead to rights as living toys by all measure of logic and sanity. They are, at the very least, some of the stupidest toys to ever forget to pretend not to be alive. Now it's on to the museum! Museum? <laughs> and now you learn the movie set this whole record player thing up just for a cheap record scratch gag at the sound of something shocking. Al's coming! <gasps> Go! Oh, go on, oh. Jesse! Yes, go! And somehow clean up all those styrofoam peanuts on the floor, and put away the videotapes, and turn off the TV, and Jesus, this is hopeless, isn't it? We have a friend in need. 
and unnecessary patriotism. And that concludes our broadcast day. What? Bull TV channels haven't been signing off this way since decades before this fucking movie takes place. But whatever makes the parental nostalgia bell go ring-a-ding-ding, -ding, right? I see that cheese all over his fingers, but how did it get there? This bowl is completely full. He fell asleep before he had time to eat any of it. How blind is Woody to have not seen any of this prior to stepping on the first cheese puff? Just like in real life, horses are so worried about being helpful, they don't realize how much noise they're making. Wait. Well, Lucky Bullseye decided to wake up and join Woody then, because I don't think he could have climbed the couch without it. Let's just say Al wakes up now, by chance. Is there some kind of toy court where Woody would face charges of failing to pretend to not be alive? Bullseye ignores hundreds of actual cheese puffs in order to lick the dust off the fingers of a dude I'm pretty sure didn't even eat any himself. <laughs> yep, toys can smell. Who knew? No, Officer, I swear! Somehow Pixar thought this would be hilarious dialogue for a suddenly awoken creepy guy to say. No idea where they were going with that, but it's creepy as hell. Super serious toy collector dude pays no heed to his cheesy fingers while picking up a priceless toy. What? You think I did that? Woody accuses Jesse of turning on the TV when he tried to take back his arm, but somehow she didn't see Stinky Pete do it. Why are there spikes on this road when there's no boom barrier blocking it? Stop. Massive miracle. Also, apparently no one notices these cones moving by themselves. Road that was pretty much abandoned a minute ago will decide to be the hardest level of Frogger ever so the heroes have a challenge. Also, I'm pretty sure these toys caused a 14 car accident where many, many people were killed. We just didn't see it because the movie is rated G. This pipe fell off a truck that had to haul all sorts of momentum to stop, and yet it rolls like a gang of nerdy guys are pushing it uphill. Toy Fixer Dude turns out to be the old man from the Pixar chest short, which I suppose thrills and delights me to no end, right? <sighs> You can't rush art. You hear that, Marvel? Why is the automatic door open and working, but the closed sign is still in the window? Someone didn't do their job all the way. These toys all just saw a human worker come in here, but now they're spreading out just openly wandering around shouting Woody, as though no humans could be nearby. While I admit it would be weird to see an aisle full of other yous, Buzz already experienced the whole I'm not unique and I'm a toy thing last movie. Overstock. This raises an interesting philosophical question, though. At what point do toys in this universe become self-aware? You know, they make it so you can't defeat Zerg unless you buy this book. It's extortion, that's what it is. Wait until you get to the era of DLC and in-game purchases, T-Rex. You got it good right now, trust me. This thing has working gas and brake pedals? Get the fuck out of here, movie. These guys are in a car driving around a toy store where there are no helpful warnings from Andy's mom that someone's about to come into the room. Movie thinks that if it swaps in a second buzz in place of Woody, then I'll overlook the fact that it's literally repeating an entire scene from the first movie. You know how the rest of this goes at this point, right? Movie is wrong. These Barbies know how to party. One question though, why didn't they let any of the Ken dolls join the bash? They'd be in the same aisle, right? Also, no other toy sold in this store is stupid enough to be awake at this point, but all the Barbie stuff is having a pool party right now? What do toys do in the age of security cameras, by the way? I feel sad for this Barbie because she is cooking a steak that will never get cooked enough. Back in 1995, short-sighted retailers did not order enough dolls to meet demand. Disney complaining about not getting enough money. Also, I guess they've more than made up for it by overbuying on the next go-around. See how that works? Tiny Tim can still get his operation after all. No, if this guy was the true collector he's been made out to be, he'd know better than to put his greasy fingers all over the priceless toy just to take an obscene number of posed photos in order to then sell said priceless toy. Oils, dust, potential damage, this guy is ignoring all the obsessive collector basics. It's like printing my own money. What serious toy collector or serious eBay seller would take and use Polaroids of the merchandise? Sure, it looks better for this shot to have him holding physical pics, but it's dumb as hell. On my way to the office to fax them to you! And he's going to fax them to the buyer! Take too many pictures, use Polaroid Instant Film, and then fax results! This guy has never sold a high-value item in his life. Can somebody love me? Damn, this scene's going to appeal to my soft side and make me remove sins, isn't it? Every one of these transitions suggests this girl outgrew her love of horses for stuff like makeup and music. But what's going to outgrow her love of being a stereotype? Huh. This suggests that Emily grew up during the 60s and 70s, what with the record player and the posters. But she has a poster for a concert at Pixar Studio for the Lemurs on November 25th, 1999, the day after the release of this movie. Something's fishy about that. I don't know what. Man, this donation center is out in the middle of f***ing nowhere. Buzz just managed to escape at the perfect time and sees Rex's tail hanging out of this bag so he knows where to go next. Buzz somehow knew these particular toys in this order would lead to him flying toward the door. Zerg toy just happened to be mixed in with the bargain bin. I guess because no one likes to buy the Buzz Lightyear villain, but no one wants to buy Buzz Lightyear either, according to the shelves in this place. Imposter Buzz is able to pull this vent out. You know, I think that buzz owl went to his head. These idiots still haven't figured out they've got the wrong buzz. Elevator ex machina. Actually, Buzz then decides not to use the elevator, but then, yeah, elevator Ex Machina. Hello, that looks like a thing I can't see since my eyes are covered. Wait a minute, are you saying Mr. Potato Head's eye works even when it's not attached to him? This guy was blind in the last movie when they knocked out his eyes, so you're filthy cheaters, Pixar. You're a child's plaything. 
You are a toy! Symmetry. You've got a friend in me. Retro version of Randy Newman's song from the first movie gives Woody the idea he needs to advance the plot. I thought the guy did a really professional job fixing Woody, but apparently he can just scrape the paint off with a couple of swipes. Right. No one heard or saw him exit the box and walk over here and do this. Totally. Also, Stinky Pete tightens the screws on this vent, the only method Andy had for escape, but didn't do this any time earlier when he knew everyone was asleep. Buzz and gang react to Zerg before Zerg is even visible. Zerg took his sweet ass time finding Buzz, didn't he? Although maybe he had complications involving getting to this floor, but I'm still sending it because of this perfect timing. This should mean Mr. Potato Head lost all his body parts to the elevator shaft, but no, nope, it doesn't. You killed my father! No, Buzz. I am your father. No! Parody note. Also, this line of toys is a serious ripoff of Star Wars, from the story to their sound effects. I know this is just another Newman, Dennis Nedry character Wayne Knight is playing here, and he's evil and dumb, but can he seriously not hear the slinky behind him? I finally defeated Zerg! Rex thinks pushing the toy Zerg off an elevator is the same as defeating him in the video game. And as a guy who actually killed a number of mother brains in real life, I can tell you that my inability to beat them in video games left my frustration intact. Mr. Potato Hat somehow stops these heavy double doors from closing, which is some bullshit. Pizza, anyone? Pizza truck from the first movie, Ex Machina. Strangers from the outside. I didn't realize until re-watching this how much lip service this movie pays to the first one. I guess I should be glad that these toys are somehow finding a way to drive this car, but this really goes against all the rules and general stuff they needed to worry about in the first movie. And plus, it's toys driving a car somehow. Coordination between all these idiot toys on their first time driving makes me kind of angry. Drive angry. There he is. How did Al park his car and get to check in so fast? How are Buzz's feet protruding through this pet carrier's floor in order to propel it along the carpet? Ooh, a puppy! Uh, bark, 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 bark! Bark, bark, bark! This works. It's not a Pixar movie unless there's a giant factory or a maze of conveyor belts to navigate. Pixar goes for that classic Butte joke, which is something Beavis and Butthead Do America did two years earlier, and everyone did whenever Butte, Montana was founded. It's amazing what transpires to make Woody look exactly the same when he finally gets back into the arms of Andy. Toy Story 2 steals the flashing camera weapon from Rear Window and that itchy and scratchy land episode of The Simpsons. Toy Horse with no real hooves will catch up to this gas-powered vehicle, American Airlines. Wow, that Toy Horse was running at the same speed as an about-to-take-off jumbo jet. I'm not even mad, that's amazing. These toys put great faith in the fact that Andy's mom won't find it weird when Andy mentions this tour. Oh wow, new toys! Yeah, a horsey and a girly doll. What's not to love when you like exclusively dude toys and only use Bo Peep when you need a female for Woody to save? Welcome to Al's Toy Barn. It's good that Al approved an ad where he was so sad we could see the results of his comeuppance. Mr. Shark looked in the toy box and found me an extra squeaker. Which means there's another toy with its squeaker completely ripped out. Either that or this toy comes with a spare squeaker of some sort, which I'm not buying for one minute. When did all these Barbies make it into the household? Andy's little sister is like two years old. She's not playing with multiple Barbies yet, is she? <laughs> Woo! I don't remember eating that! Cut. Uh, no, I can't. Now, let's think about this for a second. This is an animated movie about toys coming to life when humans aren't around. But these outtakes tell us they're actually actors pretending to be toys that only come to life when the humans aren't around. Oh, behind the scenes toys are filming this. No, it's humans filming living toy actors, all right. I think my existentialism just threw me a left uppercut. Isn't this exciting, Heimlich? Pixar accidentally puts ants in Toy Story 2. DreamWorks is gonna be pissed when they find out. 45 seconds of Disney and Pixar basically 69ing each other. Boy, Andy's toy-based daydreams got a budget increase, no? Um, didn't Pixar miss a golden opportunity here to put the car-shaped bluffs from cars in the background of the scene? Even if this is in some kid's imagination, Jesse and Bullseye were nowhere near the back of this train in order to save Woody. Take that, imagination. Also, all Toy Story movies must open with a fantasy sequence. The first one had Woody's Old West Adventures, the second had the T-Rex playing the video game that was supposedly real for a few minutes, and this one has this. That's what you call a formula, kids. Andy imagines an ex-machina for the train falling off the cliff, and later grows up to write Hollywood screenplays. I brought my attack dog with a built-in force field. Well, I brought my dinosaur who eats force field dogs. Andy's imagination has improved greatly, but he still does the old force field dog dinosaur who eats the force field dogs routine. Cartoon found footage. I would make fun of Andy setting up all his toys to watch a movie, but then I remember laying out all my baseball cards as a kid while watching a baseball game, and I'd sub in the right card when the manager made a roster change, and goddamn, I miss being a kid. F*** you, movie, for making me miss being a kid. Even in the young Andy era depicted by this video, I still can't believe he's still enamored with his Woody doll. Woody was practically replaced in the first movie by Buzz Lightyear, but because of some bullsh**, he suddenly gets equal billing in Andy's mind. Wait! I can't find my other eye! Then why did you take it out in the first place? Also, didn't previous movies show us your organs still work, even when not attached? So why not just look through that eye to figure out where it is, man? Eh? Who are we kidding? The kid's 17 years old! He's 17 and still has a gigantic toy chest prominently featured in his room. 
And let's face it, when the trash bags come out, we army guys are the first to go. So many thoughts sprung up here. First off, the army guys have a network of other army guys where they know they're the first to go when it's time to clean out toys. Second off, there are only three army guys here, so they've apparently left the hundreds of other army guys to be trashed. Third off, they do this despite a decent chance of getting seen. Fourth, I guess they just knock around people's houses until they find a bunch of other army guys to hang with. Oh, we've lost friends along the way. Wheezy and Etch and Bo Peep. I guess these toys weren't worth having an adventure for. Also, holy sh movie hints at an even darker Toy Story 3 storyline regarding the fate of Bo Peep, but then it passes it by like it's no big deal. And, and those guys from the Christmas decorations box, they're fun, right? How many inanimate objects come to life in this world? Christmas decorations? Are they infused with a life of toys? Come on, let's see how much we're going for on eBay. You two? Not much, is my guess. Also, it's 2010, so thinking eBay is the ultimate online aftermarket sales destination at this point is just living in the past. Andy, who is an asshole, ate this apple and left it on a plate on his dresser. The first thing that I noticed here is that these concert tickets are dated 2009, which is 14 years after the original Toy Story, which means Andy should be 20 years old at this point, not 17, unless Toy Story was set in the future or some sh Also, you might remember that November 17th, 2009 was a Tuesday, like I do, because I have that kind of calendar memory and sh Also, I googled it, you know, just to make sure. Nice memory exposition board, but, um, this letter here is addressed to State University, which means Andy has not yet applied for college. That classic Toy Story decision, will Andy pick Buzz or Woody? And to my amazement, it's Woody! I can't breathe! But you can breathe in the toy chest, I guess. And what happens if you can't breathe for too long? Do you finally become a real toy? And this entire movie's events happen because this one American home has an exceptionally springy pull-down attic door. Do I have that right? Jesus. Andy clearly wanted to save all the toys, but thanks to construction work, we have an adventure to watch first. What are the odds that the garbage truck is three f***ing houses away right at this moment? Astronomical, you say? Point, point, point! Not only are the toys strong enough to puncture this bag with a toy dinosaur tail, but they're able to make a big enough hole without being seen in world record time so that they can escape. Luckily, the guy picking up the garbage has both sunglasses and headphones on for maximum obliviousness. Buzz! Jesse! And that should end this little adventure. This should have been a Pixar short that ended right here. Unfortunately, some total bullshit is about to happen to allow the rest of this movie to take place. There's no time to be hysterical. It's the perfect time to be hysterical. So keep playing the hits, boys. Y yeah, I know. It looks bad. But guys, you gotta believe me. They should, but they don't. It's crazy how many license plates in this world have A113 on them. That's gotta make the cop's job harder. And the DMV's job the easiest ever. Mine, and I have been growing apart for years. It's just... <laughs> I can't believe she would throw me away! Okay, I'm going to ignore the blatant sexism and having a Barbie doll meltdown like Sharon Stone in Casino and focus on the fact that it was clearly not Molly's preference to get rid of any toys, but her mom commanded it. Disney utterly breaks my sin-writing brain with a shot that contains over 1,200 unique details to scrutinize, and I'm just gonna call this Disney 1, Cinema Sin 0, and move on. Well, hello there! Big Purple Bear with a cane telegraphs this toy's evilness in the first second. Come and pull! <laughs> first thing you gotta know about me, I'm a hugger. This is exactly what Uncle Henry said to me just before he took me out behind the, hey, is that a purple dinosaur? Maybe Andy doesn't care about us anymore. This movie gets so much mileage out of that upstairs hallway trash bag misunderstanding. He was putting you in the attic. I saw you can't just- All toys disregard or flat out don't hear this statement. At this point, doesn't Woody deserve the benefit of the doubt? Bullseye, no. You need to stay. After that big speech about leaving, Woody and Sino Man's bullseye. This wet floor sign says no running which makes me think that there was a period, however brief, at the wet floor sign factory when the workers went on a passive strike, creating signs that said things like no running, stop, drop, and roll, and I'm on strike. Woody Ratatouille's his way out of this situation. Yes, he's never been here before, but basic looking where you're going could have avoided this almost fall off the edge moment for Woody. Woody somehow assumes he has to cross this entire playground to escape, and never once considers just running to his left to the edge of the roof, which is clearly much closer to the wall. Stupid Woody. Luckily, Woody's hat is blown by the breeze straight into the kite ex machina that he will use to get off this roof. Of course, no one sees this. How many films can claim wind as an actual antagonist? Like this one and Twister, I guess, right? Oh, the happening! Thankfully for Woody, in this film's plot, a three-year-old girl happened to be walking right here at this moment all by herself. In the end, though, is this any different from what Andy did to these toys when he was filming the train robbery sequence in his head? He put those toys through hell, right? But this is supposed to be worse? Also, I'll admit this toddler stampede is hilarious, but the fact that none of these worldwide toys who lived with a toddler for years picked up on the fact that daycare might not be so awesome. You're doing great! Are you classically trained? Is there a situation where one of these toys broke character? Even in the first movie, Buzz, as deluded as he was, didn't break character, and Woody only did it in an emergency to that evil kid Sid, who's a serial killer now. Are we supposed to believe that a daycare leaves all the toys lying around like this at the end of the day? <laughs> Thanks for that imagery, Pixar. 
Did anyone notice the transom? Why is it open? Nobody knows. Yes, he's a toy, but I've played with pipe cleaners before and they are not suitable restraints, especially when the toys are sentient. F-A-O my Schwartz. Taking a toy store's name in vain while hacking up a space Spaceballs reference. I'll go get my friends. Whoa, whoa, hold on there, boss. Buzz specifically requested that he and his friends move to the cool kids room, and Lotso said request granite. It's impossible he didn't hear the specifics of the request, but you gotta pad your features runtime somehow. There's a Buzz Lightyear instruction manual just lying around in the library of a daycare. Ow! To return your Buzz Lightyear action figure to its original factory setting, no! slide the switch from play to demo. Why would there be such a switch on the back of an action figure? What can you add to a Buzz Lightyear that would require you to go back to demo mode? And why does it make a difference for this toy and everything he's learned? I thought these features made no difference in a world where Christmas decorations apparently come to life. I see and it. What? That's impossible. My other eye, the one I left behind. It's just now letting you see Andy's room. That's amazing. So at none of the time while you've been gone, have you seen Andy's room until now? Hmm, great timing for this eye to suddenly work so that the toys that thought they were being thrown away know that they were actually being loved by Andy after all. I have over 30 accessories and I deserve more respect. Uh, Lotso takes off her mouth to stop her from yelling. Hilarious. But last movie and this movie showed her eyes and ears work even when detached. So why aren't these lips in his hands still bitching out Lotso? When Buzz's factory setting was introduced to Andy's toys in the first movie, he was combative as hell. But in this movie, returning him to factory setting makes him programmable and controllable. This feels like an overabundance of clothes baskets that the evil toys can use for daycare prison. Where the f*** did he get that? Woody left it outside, remember? And who at this messy-ass daycare would have noticed it and actually put it back inside? Or else this suggests someone on Lotso's evil team managed to get outside the daycare walls to grab this hat here by the road. These toys now know how to use Google Maps. It's right around the corner! Because of course it is. Ruled by an evil bear who smells of strawberries. Shouldn't he smell like strawberries and at least a little bit daycare? Daisy loved us all. Let me guess, this ends with Daisy either losing or giving away her toys, much like what happened to Jesse in Toy Story 2, only this time without a song. I mean, don't all these toys have pretty much the same stories that keep leading us to the same kind of movies? Also, ain't it great Woody found a home where one of the toys that broke out of Sunnyside used to hang with Lotso, and this backstory is going to be important to this movie's plot? These parents left behind three toys when they put their daughter in the back seat. Three huge, easily seen toys marked by their daughter as her favorites, and they seem like such loving parents. It took forever, but we finally made it back to Daisy's. Homeward Bound, The Incredible Toy Travels. Cast off. Unloved. Unwanted. And riding on the back of a pizza truck from the first Toy Story. Nothing but sand and a couple of Lincoln Logs. Uh, I don't think those were Lincoln Logs. Pixar steals the gross poop joke from DreamWorks Shrek movies. Between the Toy Story films and the Finding films, it's pretty obvious the bulk of Pixar writers and animators think children are demons. There's only one way toys leave this place. Poor fella. Trash truck comes at dawn. Then it's off to the dump. So wait, can that toy not wake up like every other toy and simply get out of that trash or escape the trash truck? You know, if it were Woody, he would. The monkey's the eye in the sky. He sees everything. Classrooms. Except when Buzz broke out earlier, the monkey totally didn't see that. In fact, it took Buzz running into the big baby in the attic of that snack machine for the evil toys to even notice he was gone. Oops, you forgot that, didn't you? Even the playground. Yeah, but these toys managed to get past all that other security before they stupidly tried to openly scale the wall. So either this monkey is terrible at his job, or the cautious toys trying to make their escape decided to be careless at the most crucial time. This monkey sees everything, unless he's being distracted by Mr. Potato Head, who has already been cornered by the other employees of Lotso's security detail. Wait a minute, was this always here? Or did Woody cut this out? Seems like if Mr. Potato Head knew this was here, his first night in the box wouldn't have gone so bad. Somehow, Toy Story 3 found room for a changing outfit montage, like we're watching Mrs. Doubtfire or Dumb and Dumber. Get the tortilla! The tortilla. As in a tortilla you knew about before this plan started? How did you know it was in this lunchbox, carelessly left behind by a toddler anyway? Still can't believe the best idea they had was for Potato Head to plug this into a f***ing tortilla, as opposed to, oh, I don't know, a molded glob of Play-Doh or something. They basically rewrote all the rules of the Potato Head family to make this movie work. Luckily, they did this on a night with a full moon, huh? I don't know why this couldn't wait until morning, Ken, but... Barbie dresses up like astronaut Ken to fool the bookworm, but how did she ask for the Buzz Lightyear manual without sounding like Barbie doing a bad Ken impression? Cross it! Do not hold button for more than five seconds. <sighs> 
Bitácora espacial. Holding the Buzz Lightyear reset button for more than five seconds turns him into Antonio Banderas. We gotta switch him back. Well, how do we do that? I don't know. That part's in Spanish. This is actually becoming infuriating. How would you know those particular directions are in Spanish? And why would an instruction manual with English and Spanish instructions only have instructions for changing him back in Spanish? And wouldn't there be a picture somewhere? If you ever find yourself wondering how this third movie in a series is an hour and 45 minutes long, look no further than this scene here. I'm sorry, cowboy. <gasps> They broke me. Fine, but you did not know their entire plan, or their exact up to the second location, did you? Also, how did they know to torture this asshole? They would have had to know something was already going down before going to him and torturing him, right? Dad. Big Baby would be excellent at cinema sins. The needs of the one. Oh, God damn it! the needs of the many outweigh the- Oh, fuck it. How the fuck did that happen? The dumpster door was completely closed when they started running across it. Now he's stuck in the door? Come on. And of course, that's the way the Ned Beatty bear gets Woody into the dumpster. Toys have the power to lift giant TVs up. Just wanted to let you guys know that. Don't worry, Slick, we'll get you down. Uh, you might want to take a look at this. You better come take a look at this cliche. It's not a Pixar movie unless the heroes are on some sort of giant conveyor belt of death. Despite Lotso being basically the devil, Woody will still feel compelled to try and save him, ultimately endangering the lives of everyone else in the process. Hashtag just let Lotso die. Push it! Push, push your kid now, Sheriff! And that's what you get for trusting a dude that has been nothing but a 100% asshole dick face this entire movie. Mount Doom literal fires of hell make this children's movie dark as f I have at least one niece that is scarred for life thanks to this movie. Claw ex machina. Also, yep, those three somehow separated from the main group, then overpowered the humans in this claw control room, then figured out the claw controls in a matter of seconds. Also, how the f does this large ass claw somehow pick up every single toy in danger without a single one slipping through the- Oh, f it, like I really care. Sure, this romance began when he was in Spanish mode, but still, what the f right? All toys should be doing it. I had me one of these when I was a kid! Movie couldn't just let Lotso get away with it. He had to be found by a garbage guy who actually loved this toy as a kid, but somehow is inexplicably punished by being hung up on a truck grill for some reason. And he's still packing! <gasps> but he's almost done! Jeez, how long does it take for this asshole to pack? Hey. And he doesn't even remotely question why the toys he knows he threw into a garbage bag and he knows his mom took to the curb are now here, neatly in a box waiting to be sent to the new kid. And so we're assholes. This ending is extremely f***ing touching. It might even make you cry. I'm just gonna remove five sins and be done with it. But also, when I was Andy's age, I sold all my Transformers toys in a garage sale so I could pass them on and grow up, and I regretted it hard. Like, I might have cried about it once or twice my freshman year in college during the really lonely nights kinda hard. And by me, I mean some other loser who cries over toys that is definitely not me. I'm sorry, Optimus. Zerg sits out the entire third movie, and somehow I'm supposed to be satisfied because he's ending up at the Guantanamo Bay daycare. I know many people find Luxo Jr.'s booty shake all cute and stuff, but I think he or she is just obnoxiously waving their shiny metal ass in my face after taking 45 seconds to get through just two logos. Billy, go, Gruff, raise the blinds. I mean, the blinds are right there, and Woody and Peep aren't doing anything else. Would it be easier to just do it yourself, or did you need a quick character introduction joke for a three-headed sheep? I've said it before, I'll say it again. Slinky Dog Slink should be as slack as a geriatric <laughs> Barrel of ex-monkinus? How does Andy's mom not see Slinky Dog spring falling out an open window? A window she should definitely be wondering how it's open since it's pouring rain and Andy's sister is still too young to open it herself. Sometimes they get left in the yard or put in the wrong box. And that box gets taken away. And then the new owners see the toy and tell the previous owner, hey, I think you accidentally put Andy's toy in here. And then that toy is returned. This is why brains are important. As terribly depressing as this moment is, it's visually stunning. The entire rain sequence is a reminder of how far digital animation has come since we first laid eyes on Woody. There you are. Mom, I found him, I found him. Oh, good. Andy put Woody on his bed with the rest of the toys, but finds him in the driveway in the rain. I'm guessing that finding Woody in unexpected places has been a recurring mystery in his childhood. How has he never questioned this phenomenon? We've gone back nine years to revisit Andy's childhood when we already left his childhood in the previous movie. How many nostalgic playing with my Woody moments do we really need? Also, don't let the nostalgic crack of Randy Newman singing You've Got a Friend in Me distract you from the fact that this is basically an overlong credit sequence that amounts to those catch-up montages Netflix shows you when a new season of your favorite show drops. Keep it to a dull roar, Rex. Deep breath, Jesse. Deep breath. Settle down, Slink. Why are they freaked out about being in a closet? Isn't most of a toy's life spent in dark, confined spaces? We've seen them in toy boxes and moving boxes before, and no one's seen Ben out of shape about it then. Also, when they aren't being played with, are they forced to be awake? Can't they just assume a comatose position and ride out any boring parts in the sweet embrace of inanimate nothingness? Based on the rules established in this universe, why aren't these playing cards alive? What you gonna name it? Uh, what about Dusty? Francis? Oh. Harry? How loud is this conversation exactly? Because those toys obviously don't care if they're hurt. Hey, what are you here? But shouldn't Jesse leave that 
that on since Bonnie put it that way? As concerned as they seem to be about getting caught, you'd think they might not want to make obvious changes like that. And sure, a five-year-old probably won't remember, and no one would believe them if they did, but why risk it? Damn, Pixar gets emotion, don't they? The first day at kindergarten section is heart-wrenchingly poignant, and proof that Pixar can still hack the human heart. Consider my frayed heartstrings sufficiently tugged, you bastards. Hi. And the director said, just in case him ignoring her and taking away her supplies isn't enough, let's remind the audience that even six-year-old assholes have to be eating an apple. Ah yes, a trick! I'm sure this will happen many more times in this movie. So let's just add ten sins for the someone should absolutely notice this moving toy beneath or beside it bull**t. Junk drawer Jesus in Hasbro heaven. Look at all these toys. This is the problem when you keep making sequels and add new characters each time. Now everyone needs a few lines and sufficient screen time to justify inclusion. So you end up paying Jeff Garland a boatload of money to just come in and say random things into a microphone. Why does he want to go to the trash? Because he was made from trash. I mean, sure, and you were likely made from Taiwanese plastic, but I don't see you subconsciously booking a flight to Taipei. Plus, Buzz woke up with a full awareness of his toy's backstory and catchphrases. So I think the sentience rules in this universe remain unclear. Which she started playing with him? She had the biggest smile on her face. How is Forky's mouth clay staying attached to his face? And how is he able to shape it into different expressions on the fly? Forky? Where are you, Forky? There you are. Why is Forky not jumping back into the trash here? We know that the toys control their own playing dead moments, but Forky hasn't bought into any of that, doesn't even want to be a toy, and is completely focused on getting to the trash can. So why is he going limp like the rest of the toys whenever Bonnie is looking? You need help with him on the road trip? Why would Woody be going on the road trip? Bonnie said, I'm gonna bring Dolly and Buttercup and Forky. And Woody isn't mentioned, which isn't a surprise, considering they've already established that Woody isn't her favorite toy right now. The meat mountain is suspiciously cheap for having two kinds of meat, multiple buns, tons of veggies, and must require five minutes to assemble, not to mention the strange container that would have to be custom made to fill it. What is Bonnie doing right now? She leaves the trailer and immediately comes back. Is it because she doesn't know how to use the camera? Or is the movie saying she jumped out of an RV, snapped a photo of the canyon, then ran back to the vehicle in under three seconds? Mind you, she is a Kodak Cliff, can barely see over the wall, and is maybe six or seven years old. Where are her goddamn parents? This is an abduction, and this fork is either going to learn to love its captors or get mad enough to stab someone. I'm game for the second. I swear the last five minutes of this movie has been comprised of Forky getting lost, people looking for him, then finding him in some random spot that makes no sense, and nobody questioning how he got there. I know you weren't around when Andy was little, but I don't remember it being this hard. Were you in charge of Andy? Was Andy a newly sentient fork whose sole purpose was to throw himself in the trash? How are the two things even comparable? The voice inside of you. Who do you think it is? Is Buzz still an idiot? Because he certainly should know a common figure of speech like this by now. Force B plot has to force its B in my plot, I guess. I am not a toy. I'm a spark. Be quiet. I was made for soup, salad, maybe chili, and then the trash. The ramifications of Forky having an awareness of his purpose even before he became sentient are terrifying. This means on some level your toilet paper is sentient and well aware of the it's about to go through. I never thought I'd see an animated version of The Road, but here we are. Who does she sleep with every night? The big white fluffy thing? No, not her pillow. So you know the words big fluffy white, but not pillow? And later you even correct Woody about the difference between a merry-go-round and a carousel. So pillow should definitely be in your vocabulary. Oh no, there's light coming from that window behind me. I better pause dramatically and take a look back. I know it seems like an everyday thing that wouldn't catch anyone's attention, but what if there is an important plot turn that needed to happen? Once he goes in this mail slot, he has no plan on how to get back out again. Believe me, everyone needs an escape plan when antiquing. Is that both? <laughs> Movie is great news for the throng of people who thought the one thing the Toy Story universe needed was jump scares and an Annabelle vibe. Any sign of Woody? Failed Viagra slogans. The slingshot maneuver is all we've got. Full speed ahead. Very specific instructional recording in a toy is strangely specific and instructional. Hello, Mr. Cowboy. How are you today? Of all the carnival and RV parks in all the towns and all the world, Woody just happens to stumble into Bo. And not just any Bo Peep, THE Bo Peep. Are discarded playground toys a thing? I mean, I found a shovel in the sandbox once, but never anything of substance. Of course, it's quite possible I was too busy applying salve on my third degree burns from sliding down the metal slide to notice, so we'll just make this sin about public playgrounds in general. I'll hand it to you, the frisbee definitely blocks one side of the world from seeing you, but not the other. <laughs> Ew. I've been practicing. How do I look? Practicing for what? Tea time? But if she's playing with you, you can't be doing any motions, right? So again, I inquire, practicing for what? When my voice box is fixed. So why don't you just remove your broken voice box and talk with your voice you're using now? As the first Toy Story demonstrated, humans can hear you just like when you were talking to your toy friends. So why not just act like a toy but speak when your string is pulled? And if you really want to fool people who think your voice is too real, you can simply disconnect the voice box so that if anyone checks to see if you have one, they'll see it in there and ask no further questions unless they're a sicko. Worker at a place where lots of stuff is going down, is wearing headphones, and can't hear any of the crazy madness cliche. Why are you so bad at driving? 
You got six eyes. That's highest. Also, better question, how do they see out of this skunk car? Trust me, I've been there. And you know about me and He-Man. I'm not proud. Movie hints at a Giggles He-Man hookup without sharing any of the graphic details, and I, for one, am dissatisfied. What you looking at, Sheriff? Yeah, Woody, how's the bow peeping? Woody, 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 Woody. Meteor shower, look out! Woody? Good work, inner voice. <sighs> Who are these guys? Well, Woody, they're additional secondary comic relief characters to help an established property feel fresh and younger. In the industry, it's known as pulling a poochie. Granted, they are a hilarious poochie to pull, but a poochie has been pulled nonetheless. Go back in time and warn Woody about the future. That's crazy. I'm <laughs> Was that a True Detective reference in a kid's movie? Because I think that was a True Detective reference in a kid's movie. Oh my maker. That sheep has three heads. Mm, no, no, no. They've been on the roof working toward a plan for several minutes and just noticed this. <laughs> Okay, Pixar's just showing off now, because that is basically a photorealistic cat. Part of me wants to take off some sins for this incredible digital artistry, but the larger part of me is instead going to sin it because why do cats need to look real? But the humans still look like clumps of plasticine with facial features attached. <gasps> is that how we look on the inside? Apart from this toy horror moment, I was just wondering what makes any toy sentient. Is it a name on the foot? Because not all the toys have that. Is it his eyes? Not all the toys have eyes. Is it being loved by a human? Not all toys have been loved by humans. What is the rule? Also, I was thinking about Mrs. Potato Head and her eyeball. If she had to have a replacement eyeball, does that mean that she'd be looking out of another potato's eyes? Or does it acclimate to her toy spirit after being pressed into her eye socket? Is there a Wicca page for this? What are we doing? Shh! Just stand there and be quiet. Why is Bo so insistent on not making a peep about her plan? In the real world, plans work better when you communicate them to the others involved. But in movies, characters are left in the dark for maximum delayed discovery emotional impact. This, as it continues to remind us, is a movie. Woody me. Duke Kaboom! Canada's greatest stuntman! Yes, I love Keanu too, and Duke is a blast in this, but the movie is introducing new characters so often I can hardly keep track of who's who. What is this, a presidential primary race? I had a kid. Jean was so excited when he got me after Christmas. Another kid not playing with a toy anymore, guilt trip. More like a guilt skip, am I right? But when Rajon realized I couldn't jump as far as the toy in the commercial. After one try? Got a ride. Yes. So can Woody choose which recording plays when he fingers his ring and tugs his string? Or is his randomizer calibrated for maximum convenience? One of the many things that irritate me about scenes like this is that I am so distracted by this impossible jump that I can't focus on what the movie wants me to be thinking, which has something to do with wanting to bang a hot toy. This customer is not only buying this wooden duck, but she is very intently examining its backside. This woman's duck obsession has me intrigued enough that I demand the movie follow that story to its completion or face the consequences. There are many things this movie doesn't get right, but this callback to Wally B is a beautiful nod to the rich history of the animators and all they've accomplished. Remove a sin! You can't teach this old toy new tricks. Unless there's billions of dollars to be made. In which case, bring on the new tricks. <laughs> You're my favorite deputy! <laughs> Let's talk about pull string mechanics briefly, shall we? The string is pulled to create spring tension that turns the internal disc, plays the sound, and simultaneously retracts the string. But if the string is not released, the tension can't turn the disc and therefore can't play the sound. In fact, even if the string starts to retract and then it starts to play sound but is stopped part way, the sound immediately stops as well. My point is we should not be hearing any of Woody's catchphrases as long as his string remains fully extended. And we especially shouldn't be hearing multiple consecutive ones. I'm not so heartless that I wanted Bo and her sheep to shatter here, but those sheep should be porcelain dust and we all know it. How did changing the tire take this long? It was the middle of the day when Jesse sabotaged you. Also, and this might answer my question, but did he fix the tire without a jack? It's okay. Any minute now, Bonnie will notice her backpack is missing. You good, Bonnie? Yep. Kids. Your backpack's in the antique store. Let's go! Are we pretending that no adults heard that even though the mother is putting buzz into this cabinet? If this happened in real life, there would be a nationwide buzz-burning panic party. The last time we saw this red slap hand, it was stuck to the top of the carousel. How and when was she able to retrieve it? More importantly, how has it kept its tackiness after reuse? I found this old doll. You can take it home if you want. Meh. Wow, brutal and strangely beautiful. The movie somehow manages to not only create empathy for its villain, but reminds us that the things we want to fix about ourselves won't fix everything. These Pixar folks might actually know what they're doing. Forky! Mom, I found him! For f sake, I know stuff always ends up in weird spots all the time and nobody ever questions it because the alternative is to think toys are alive, but this backpack was probably searched a hundred times before Bonnie's parents gave up and Jesse flattened the tire. But what about Gabby? And what about the plush toys from the carnival and the ones at the rave and the creepy ventriloquist gang and anything with eyes? Too many people. Gonna need an alternate route. So let's definitely do something impossible like going on the carousel and making Duke Kaboom try a 40-foot jump. That's a lot easier than some other things we could take five minutes to think about. Recalculating! Take a right! 
Knowing where to draw the line on your suspension of disbelief is difficult in talking toy movies, but I'm going to go ahead and draw it somewhere before human believes a completely different voice that doesn't match his GPS screen and also is coming from near his feet instead of the speakers. Another right! Right! Take another right! How does Bonnie's dad hear Mrs. Rex from below, but not Buzz from above? If he can hear toys yelling at his feet, shouldn't he be able to hear one yelling that's actually much closer to his ear holes? The real life physics of a toy this size and weight making this jump would be like a 20 ton city bus jumping a construction site overpass gap without any kind of ramp and maintaining a speed of at least 50 miles per hour on the other side. When all else fails, murder the humans in a horrible vehicular accident. Toy assholes are adorable. Mommy. I wouldn't trust this little girl, mom and dad, since you're at a carnival and Jordan Peele is a voice in this movie. It could be her doppelganger. I think I understand the braking and acceleration part of how the toys are doing this, but isn't there a steering element as well to get here? Are we home? The only way this kid stayed asleep during the insane RV ride is if they spiked her sippy cup. Pretty sure that's illegal. You've got to be kidding me! The toys have sown the seeds of distrust in this vehicle so much, it's a sin to drive this trailer home afterwards. Listen to your inner voice. Speaking of which, during the horrific surgery scene, why didn't the ventriloquist hooligans let Woody keep his pull string and box components? Gabby showed that most of hers was intact and fine, just one piece wasn't working. If Woody had kept his, he could maybe have it replaced someday. I'd give a thousand sins off if Bonnie said, where's Woody right now? He left Bullseye? He left Bullseye? I mean, I can almost get on board with everything else, but there's no way Woody wouldn't have had Bullseye come with it. That breaks the cowboy code, stallions before galleons, or something. Do you really have laser eyes? <laughs> yeah. Whoa. Forced Keanu. I don't want to play with you anymore. Code red, repeat. Did you order the code red? You're goddamn right I did. What's that button do? I'll show you. Never give up. Never surrender. <laughs> Peter Pan right here off of this dam, right here! Rockets explode! It's like flying with a dead elephant on our back. Flight guidance, we're getting awfully close to center here. Aquarius, watch that middle gimbal. We don't want you tumbling off in space. Right, I'll inform Houston, I'm well aware of the goddamn gimbals. I don't like confrontations! You little scumbag! I got your name! I got your ass! You will not laugh! You will not cry! You will learn by the numbers! I will teach you! What do you say I get someone else to watch the sheep tonight? Oh. Uh oh. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm dizzy. But that never happened in home, Mac. Space. A final frontier. Maniacal laugh. Maniacal laugh. He's back? Hey, everybody! And he's back! Guess who's back? Back, back, back again. Maggie's Mouse presents The March of War. Mirror. Mirror! Uh, football practice. No, no, listen, you gotta give me the time. I did a test run on this thing, it took me 20 minutes. I thought it could maybe push to 18, but you gotta give me at least 15 minutes. Give me the 15 minutes. Bart Simpson, the spirited little scamp who twice foiled my evil schemes and sent me to this dank, urine-soaked hellhole. My name is Darth Vader. I am an extraterrestrial from the planet Vulcan. The red zone has always been for loading and unloading. There's never stopping in a white zone. Don't tell me which zone is for stopping and which zone is for loading. <coughs> <coughs> I think I'm getting the black lung, Bob. What happens if the engine stops? We all freeze and die. But what happens when the kids grow up? That's what I love about these high school girls, man. I get older, they stay the same age. Yeah. Girl. 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 Mine, 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 m
advises you. What? Because I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. I'm Litter! Who does she sleep with every night? The big white fluffy thing? No, not her pillow. Those aren't pillows. Bo! Oh, I can't believe it's Bo! So Pete! Never Ned! Ryerson! I'm Krusty the Clown and I don't like you. Cans! I'm a bit! I'm a bit! There was no bit, it was full of cans! You really have laser eyes. Yeah. Wow.